Um, so I was sitting here listening to the choir and the beautiful uh, music this morning and was thinking a little bit about um, one of the podcasts that I listen to on a regular basis. Um, and the podcast, uh, it's a 20 minute or so podcast on a couple different topics once a month. And then the, the guy who does the podcast always says, okay, my favorite detail that didn't make it into this podcast was this. And, and I was thinking about that because there, there was this, um, this section um, uh, of commentary that I was reading about today's scripture that, was, that, that I think was, must have just hit me this morning, particularly important. It said, you know, this time of life for us is kind of, it's, he called it the doldrums of winter. Um, this is the time of year, you know, the joy of Christmas and Epiphany is behind us. A lot of us are in the long stretch of January and February at work or at school. The, there's not as much sun. We have all these weather things happen. I don't know, you might have the water go out or something. And, um, and, and, and right there, this story seems to come at just the right time. Um, you, you have in First, uh, in First Corinthians, Paul talking about the untimeliness of him being called a disciple and how in the middle of nowhere, Jesus came and knocked him off uh, his animal and made him into something new. And this reading that we're going to have from Luke uh, talks about a time in which the disciples, uh, the first disciples, weren't ready for Jesus. This wasn't a good time. But here comes Jesus, and uh, the story moves ahead. So as I'm thinking about that and that important word to us today, I invite us to open our hearts and our minds to this reading from Luke's Gospel, the fifth chapter. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him in order to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there on the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. May God bless to us our reading and our understanding and our applying of these words to how we live our lives. So good morning again. Uh, with our weather and uh, water situation, I'll try to be briefer today. A shorter reflection never hurt anyone, I think. And these texts are really not all that complicated. There are some beautiful nuances, and trust me, I could go on preaching about this for hours, but I won't. Uh, we'll stick with this, okay? A point, a story or three, and then exploring how to connect it with our lives. All right. I, I, I want to hear a couple more of those, Ginger, through this sermon, okay? Here's the point. How can we find the deeper water of our lives? We live in a world where the difference between deep and shallow is sometimes hard to discern. Here's the obligatory joke. Um, Warren Buffett tells a story about a guy who was on an important business trip in Europe, and uh, his sister called to tell them that their dad had died. And, and he'd been sick for a while, and, and, but it wasn't quite expected, not on that trip, and there was just no way for, his, for him to get back. Um, so he told her to spare nothing on the funeral, the cost he would cover later. And when he returned, his sister told him that the service had been beautiful and he presented, it was presented with bills totaling $8,000. So he paid that up. But a month later, he received another bill from the mortuary, this time for $10. So he paid that too. 
and still another $10 charge he got a month later. So when he received a third $10 invoice uh, the following month, the perplexed guy called his sister to ask what was going on. Oh, she said, I forgot to tell you, we buried dad in a rented suit. Um, just like the disciples in the fifth chapter of John, we can easily toil in shallowness and not understand what we are missing. Invitations to a shallow life seem to be everywhere these days. There are cat memes aplenty on Facebook. Uh, Celebrity Big Brother is winding down on CBS. The plight of children in Jackson County in food insecure homes is obscured by an update or two on the latest multi-billion dollar contract race between Bryce Harper or Manny Machado. So that's one thing. But there's also this, I was talking with a friend just this week who's just exhausted by the day in and day out onslaught from uh, the politics and the news of our country these past few years. How can I go deeper, he said, when there's the State of the Union and attempts to cut education funding in Topeka and all sorts of scandal out of Virginia and ice storms all over the place. And that was just this week. When the crowds gathered around the lakeside that day, Jesus was surrounded by a crowd hungry for God, people who needed a guide to shift them from shallow living to deep living. Did you notice Jesus did not tell them that they needed to get away from their ordinary lives to find this depth. We don't need to go on retreat or to seek a special contemplative path or or tune out the barrage of this daily angst to engage in the depth of our faith. It can happen in a moment, in any moment of any day. Jesus could uh, could have provoked accusations of backseat fishing. You know, when he told the weary fishermen to head back out and to put their nets in deeper water. And at Jesus' request, they do. They head back out and they go to the depths and they let down their nets and the catch was so great that their nets were about to break. And everyone in the area had to work together to bring it in. And famously, Jesus tells them that from now on, you will be fishing people. A translation of the original text that misses some of the dynamism of the Greek where Jesus tells Peter that he will be taking or saving men and women alive, grabbing them for God's work. To take men and women alive, well, that's a very different image than simply catching them as though they are to be consumed. The Greek verb here describes rescue from the perils of death, not creatures in a net writhing for their last last gasps, right? This is about people living the life of God's good news in all of its fullness, no matter the anxiety or the worry or the chaos of the day. All of this happens in deeper water. What does deeper water look like for you or for me? Let's just look at a few examples. For one thing, deeper water calls us to seek out a life of forgiveness. Forgiveness. I read this week about the father of one of the children killed at that Amish school back in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania in 2006. Do you remember that? He was asked just recently about his unimaginable loss not long ago. I can't imagine being asked about something like that over and over and over again. And his feelings told the man that killed his daughter. He was asked about forgiveness. For me, he said, forgiveness is giving up my right to revenge. In our community, we talk in terms of not retaliating or holding a grudge, resentment, or bitterness, ever. In the shallow water of my days, I hold a grudge over somebody cutting me off in traffic. We need to head to deeper water in our forgiveness, whose need arises in the ordinariness of our days of strained relationships and of failed resolves along with our tense and violent world. Deeper water also leads us out into the world of need to help save men and women alive for living the fullness of God's good news. Among the many, many, many implications of that is that we need to go deeper in how we view success 
Uh, have you noticed that success is among the shallowest places in our culture? Uh, we reduce success to a house or a job or a car. We're told that success hinges on a promotion or a college acceptance letter, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, one of my mentors, uh, a pastor named Mark, shared with me once a story of someone he met named Deborah. The, Mark's church in Denver uh, once teamed up with a dozen, a dozen other churches, and they formed a group to help end homelessness in their city. And Deborah was one of the people that they served. Deborah spent many years uh, running the street. She, she was consumed by prostitution and by drugs. Deborah would say that her chaotic and out of control life was a birthright. She inherited mental illness from her parents. She learned to steal from her mother. Her mother's boyfriend forced her into prostitution. And during her years on the streets, she ran up $20,000 in debt just from emergency room visits. Deborah was arrested a dozen times a year, spending on average 100 days in jail. And Deborah's life changed on a cold November day just a couple of years ago when she realized that she needed to change her life or she would die on the streets. And so Deborah got an apartment through that homeless shelter at the church, and they provided her not just with a bed and a meal, but with a connection and with care that went around the clock. And the catch was that she would have to be clean and sober, right? To stay on her mental health medication, to find a legitimate source of income. And it was a difficult year for Deborah, but she found success. Deborah's success was measured by a different yardstick than ours. Success in that Deborah had not been arrested in 12 months. Success in that she has not woken up in the emergency room or detox for 12 months. Success in that she has stabilized her medications. Success in that she has been working. She's cooking meals and cleaning apartments in that church shelter. Success that she has created a small savings account for the first time in her life. Deborah's success came from her own hard work and from the help of church folk who were willing to go deeper into a risky enterprise of bringing life to the dead. Since Jesus' call that day on a boat near the shore was a call to go deeper than what is ordinary for us, then we need to go deeper in how we spend our time. Dan Little was a Presbyterian pastor. He died several years ago now. He, he left beyond behind a, a web of friends and colleagues. Uh, he'd been sick for a while. Uh, he had a long runway to reflect on his life and his faith. And shortly before he died, he was asked to think about his faith journey. And this is what he wrote. What I care about more deeply, hospitality and inclusiveness in a world of rejection and exclusiveness. What I care about more deeply, instances where the church loosens its grip, uh, grip on safety and familiarity in order to make contact with the world around us and to let it contact us. What I care about less, propositional orthodoxy as the essence of faith, the institutional survival of the church. What I'm more indignant about, certainty that is arrogant and condemning in the name of Jesus, what I'm indignant about, how language is used increasingly to con rather than to clarify. What I see more clearly, that our relationship with God is nine part mystery for every part understanding. That God's love is for the entire world. That how I live is a better indicator of my faith and my beliefs. That fear is a low grade infection driving our nation and our church. That worship is the church's unique and powerful art form, but we've allowed it to be limited in our tastes. That because we know God in Christ, faith is an available treasure forever. By the grace of God, Dan Little had learned to go deep. By the end of his life, he was fishing in the deepest waters that he could which can happen, I believe, to every one of us if we have the courage to sort out what we care about more deeply, what we care about less, what we are indignant about, and what we want to see more clearly. And then we change the way that we live so that we might save women and men alive for the work of God 
in the world. That might just be one method, I think, for going deeper, sorting out what we care about, what we are less care, what we care less about, what we're indignant about, what we want to see more clearly. And I was struck in these readings from today, both the reading from Paul's letter to the Corinthians and this gospel reading, how God calls us to trust that God can work through us, even us, to help bring this light and this grace to the world. Going to the deeper end is about trust. Days like today constrain our trust. This is a somewhat stressful morning. Plans for a community meal challenged by ice and snow and lack of running water. As I said this morning, though, as I was reading for the sermon today, the commentary that stuck most closely with me was the words, life is what happens to you when you are busy making other plans. The disciples did not receive their calling from Jesus when they were at a designated sacred place like a synagogue or while they were in prayer or in contemplation in their homes. Their call did not come while they were quietly listening for it or when everything that they had planned was working out just so, but rather at the end of a long and a sweaty work session where they were discouraged and ready to pack it in for the day. They were washing their nets. They got nothing. God meets us in ordinary places, sometimes when we are not ready, and shows us the depth of God's grace is there if we can reach out and take it. Dear friends, let us share grace to one another. Let's commit to lives of forgiveness and service and hope so that we can see the world differently, so that we can seek out deeper places. And so God can work through us today and tomorrow and forever. May it be so. Amen.